My subject is essentially um, experiment oriented. So this is the building block of uh, mixing in porous media. This is essentially what uh, Tongi has shown before. Um, if I remember well, his flow was uh, from the top to uh, the bottom. I have chosen the opposite convention, but this does not matter. Um, the, we have a dye here, which is injected at the bottom of a tank. It is progressively invading a um, porous medium, which is made of uh, a random stack of spheres, very similar, apparently, to those uh, you guys are uh, using in this uh, column experiment you have. Um, and the question is to understand the um, concentration structure of the mixture, the concentration content of the mixture. In other words, to answer the question, if I pick up at a given downstream distance in the medium uh, a random point, what is the probability that its concentration is within C and C plus DC? In other words, I will try to describe, I will achieve describing the um, uh, probability density function of the, of the mixture. This is usually considered, as I have heard, as a complicated problem. It is not, as you will see, as soon as you have chosen and understood the right ingredients. But one of the messages that I would like to convey here is that in order to understand this uh, complicated problem, one way is to make it even more complicated. <coughs> that instead of using only one die, one can use two dies. So one green, like in the original case, and one red here. And ask uh, the same kind of question with a variant. What is the probability that uh, the concentration of uh, either stream is within C and C plus DC at a given downstream location. But also, uh, what is the probability that if I am in a region here which is essentially green, what is the probability that I have a little bit of red as well? In other words, we will have two questions to answer and I announce the final result now. You will see that this is the same answer to these two kinds of questions, to, to these two questions which are in fact a reformulation of one to the other. Um, what is the uh, construction rule of the concentration distribution of one die? And what is, so question number one and question number two, what is the interaction rule between the two subfields that we have on purpose constructed by using two different dies? All right, so that's the program. The uh, experiment you, you see, um, where does it come from? So if you've seen the, um, the uh, experimental demonstrations in this school, uh, you, you'll have a concrete realization of uh, what is it, what it is. It's, as I was saying, um, a, a random stack of spheres which are inflated in, uh, in water. So we, these are commercial beads that uh, you can buy for basically free and you let them inflate in water. This is polyacrylamide gels. They like to be filled with water. Essentially the expansion ratio is a thousand in volume or even more. The beads are typically um, a centimeter or two centimeter in diameter. And um, the interest of doing this is that you can use um, simple water as the interstitial fluid. And since the beads are essentially filled with the interstitial fluid, you can guess that um, if you shine a uh, ray of light in the uh, resulting medium, um, this ray of light will be very gently distorted only. So this, this, this method is um, Interesting in some, uh, within, within some limits, however, you see here, this is one of these beads, um, which is uh, filled with pure water. It is uh, embedded in a, 
liquid which is filled with uh, which is which contains uh, fluorescein. This is the reason why when a um, uh, laser sheet is shined into the medium, the uh, outer stream is uh, green while the interior of the bead is uh, essentially inexistent, non-fluorescent. But what you can see also is that the, the light, which was in fact sent from the left to the right, is a little bit refracted at the edges, uh, at, the, at the surface of the, uh, of the bead, uh, indicating that you can walk around the uh, Snell Descartes. I say Snell Descartes because we have some uh, English uh, speaking uh, colleagues in the audience. If it were only a French audience, I would refer to Descartes only, of course. But if you, can, you can work out the, uh, the, the geometric uh, optics uh, problem to uh, see that the uh, difference of uh, index of refraction between the interior of the bead and the exterior of the bead is something like 10 to the minus 3. Uh, the situation would, of course, be much worse uh, if we had a, contra a larger contrast. The two uh, kinds of dyes are uh, fluorescein for the green one and rhodamine for the, uh, the interior one. And uh, we, have, uh, we are using a, an old-fashioned laser which is able to uh, excite both, um, both types of fluorescence so that we can extract independently um, the concentration field from the red field, the rhodamine, and from the green field, the um, the fluorescein. So this is explained in, the, in, uh, in, this, um, in this masterpiece published uh, in a very good journal that I invite you to publish in. All right. But you have also to realize that uh, this is a kind of um, index matching technique of the poor. Um, there are much better uh, ways of uh, doing they were uh, alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, I uh, advertise here the work of uh, my uh, Marseille colleagues, uh, notably the group of uh, Blun Metzger, who is able to achieve an index matching um, of the order of 10 to the minus 5, I think. Four. Five, the good days. <laughs> All right, uh, and um, to get rid of all these, uh, all these stripes uh, that uh, are um, uh, remaining in our um, own images. But this does not, well, th this, th th this, this, this does not limit the interest of the, um, the, interest of the, discu the, the, the discussion uh, we can have from these uh, imperfect images, per se. All right. I had, I think, originally been asked also to uh, address turbulent problems. I could give exactly the same kind of arguments as those which are following um, in, a, in a turbulent uh, context. In fact, um, the uh, fundamental ingredients which will determine the concentration content of our plume in the uh, um, porous medium are basically the same as those we would encounter in a turbulent jet or plume uh, immersed in a turbulent environment at large Reynolds number. The reason being that the objects which are involved in the problem are these filamentary structures that uh, are probably best illustrated here. They were mentioned by Tanguy Le Borgne earlier as well. These are the fundamental objects involved uh, into the mixing problem in conjunction with another ingredient that is the uh, possible interaction of these stretched lamella or sheets with each other. This second ingredient being uh, interestingly uh, envisaged and studied by the resource of to, to two different dyes, as uh, we'll see. But basically, if you understand the rate at which these lamella are stretched and their density in space, you understand everything from the, uh, about the construction of the concentration field uh, itself. All right, this is this, this constant analogy that we have between um, the um, turbulent context and the uh, porous medium context was emphasized by uh, 
Tanguy and uh, others uh, in uh, uh, another masterpiece that I recommend. Right. Okay, um, so this, this is a relatively dense uh, slide which summarizes many of the concepts we have seen uh, today. Let me write all the equations so that you can contemplate them as uh, I am speaking. All right, so we're, we're interested in uh, understanding this. The concentration content as a function of time or as a function of the distance in the medium. And we have heard before that there was a relationship between space and time in this kind of system precisely because there is an object which is called the stretching rate. The stretching rate was uh, discussed by uh, Tanguy before, um, and it was argued that this stretching rate is something like the mean velocity in the medium divided by the size of the beads. We're still discussing what is the nature of the prefactor here, if it is log of two or something different. But we are pretty much sure that this is the correct dimensional dependence. In other words, counting time of residence in this medium amounts at counting space in the units of the bit size. Right. So that's one thing. But there is some um, very refined physics in this um, in this parameter. This parameter enters into the length of these stretched sheets which are produced by the convoluted path uh, into the medium. Remember, time is essentially the uh, death into the medium. So the length increases exponentially because it's a multiplicative phenomenon stretching, folding, which was described before, it, ex it increases exponentially in time. While at the same time, we know that the end-to-end -end distance, if you like, or uh, dispersion size of our space, which is uh, allowed for these stretching and folding events to occur, we know that this the size of the box, if you like, in the box in which the flow is stirring, increases like the square root of time only. And this was described by um, uh, Marco this morning. Well, not exactly. He was uh, rather uh, talking about the longitudinal dispersion coefficient, that is, the distance between two particles which in, in the direction of the mean flow we are more interested in the transverse direction, but fortunately, and this is well known now, um, uh, the um, two uh, dispersion coefficients have the same scaling, and this is the scaling. Again, what matters is the uh, characteristic size of the beads in the present case and the uh, average velocity. So in this school, Carges, 20 years ago, there, was, there were big discussions about the status on that, and it was not even clear that in Paul's media, uh, the law was of a diffusive type. We have heard in the nice summary by uh, Marco this morning that things have settled in the meantime and that everybody pretty much agrees that this is standard dispersion and that these coefficients have a clear status, pretty much. Uh, the, 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 discuss, the discussions of the modern times, if I should say so, are more on this quantity now, its status and on the prefactors, right? So this is to show to the students that there are some progress in science. You know, discussions progress. The time scale is 20 years, but the discussions progress. All right, so we have two, two lengths, if you like. The size of the box, which increases slowly, like the square root of time. And because of the stretching and folding event, which occur every bit size in the medium, we have this exponential growth. So unavoidably, 
And provided these sheets have some width, the, there will be, a, there, there will be a, a phenomenon, a new phenomenon, which was qualitatively described by Tanguy uh, earlier, which is this phenomenon of overlap, right? So what he has shown, operator, I will need some light. So what Tongi has shown is that if you start with a blob like this, and if you distort it by one way or the other into this shape, elongated shape, whose length goes like the exponential of time, say, then locally, two phenomena compete. A phenomenon which tends to steepen the concentration gradient Okay, if I draw a line here in this direction and if I record the concentration transported by the lamella, the, transfer, the, the concentration of the dye which is transported, um, this compression phenomenon will tend to steepen the gradient of concentration precisely, while at the same time, the existence of diffusion broadening will tend to make the profile larger. The two phenomena compete and have the same uh, intensity around a typical size, which is called the bachelor size, bachelor scale. The bachelor scale is precisely holding in this limit. One can generalize as uh, Tongi did to other types of stirring, not involving an exponential, but a stretching, which is like a power law, weaker, if you like. And the way to understand the status of eta is just, as I was saying, to formalize this equilibrium, saying that d over eta square, which is the inverse of the broadening time scale by diffusion, is uh, of the order of L dot divided by L, which is the other rate we have at our disposal and which is of a pure kinematic origin. And if you do that, you discover that eta is something like, and this occurs for times which are larger. This, this is what is written if S naught was my initial size. Okay, so this is mixing in a nutshell, we'll need this because. Is that eta on both sides there? Is that right? You're right. No, oh, that's what just to check if you are following or not. Good point. Uh, so, yes, the time, this time of equilibrium is essentially given by the strengths at which you're distorting the material lines. There is a weak correction, weak because it involves a logarithm here of a quantity which is called the Peclet number, which is dimensionless, and which is essentially the ratio of the deformation time of the, the, the medium to the diffusive time. All right, so it is important to realize this in order to have an idea of the evolution of the concentration transported by the lamella after this time. Indeed, if this is the maximal concentration, which I think I have called theta here, yes, this is the theta there, you understand that simply by mass conservation, if this lamella is uh, extending exponentially in time, and if this width becomes constant after this critical mixing time, since the quantity of matter that I have put in my blob initially is conserved, something has to occur about the maximal concentration transported by the lamella itself. And it has to be such that if square root of d omega is the width of the lamella, L is its length and theta is its concentration, this has to be essentially given by S naught square, which was initially 
the concentration here if the initial concentration was one, of course. Which says that since this is a constant, theta must decay exponentially fast. So in all these lamella, these elementary lamella that we see here, all these stripes that we see here, the concentration is decaying at a rate which is prescribed by the rate of increase of the material lines in the media. Since these guys have all the thickness given by the bachelor scale, they are multiplicating exponentially in a domain which basically is not constant but evolving very slowly in time. At some point, some overlaps need to occur. And these overlaps, <laughs> that is concentration adding with another concentration, will give rise to another concentration level. And this is how the concentration builds up, the, builds up, the, the concentration levels in the overall mixture build up as time proceeds. So the number of overlaps is essentially given by, well, the departure from what I was saying before. This is the number of times I can stack the area of the distorted sheet into the available volume. Since this is increasing exponentially, this is here a weak power law dependency, this number of overlaps is increasing essentially like the uh, number, the um, uh, net area or surface of the, of, of the sheet that is exponentially. And the average concentration, the average concentration of the mixture, given that it is given, given that it is the result of the addition of these n overlaps of elementary sheets, each bearing an exponentially fast decaying concentration, the average concentration is just the result of the weakly expanding plume size, that is t minus one in the present case, since the plume size is, ex is expanding like a dispersion, a, a standard dispersion uh, relation. So if, if we have understood every of these aspects, we understand why the concentration levels in a complex mixture like the one here will be the result of additions of concentration levels. We understand why it is so simply because there is a geometrical constraint. And we also understand that provided these interactions between subparts of the mixture are made either at random or in a correlative fashion, we will have to understand what kind of addition rule will lead to the overall concentration distribution. All right, so this is the result of the experiment. The average concentration decays like uh, 1 over t or 1 over x. Remember that t and x are the same. The dispersion of the, the size of the box, if you like, increases, the square increases proportionally to time. And yes, we have here uh, concentration distributions, so coarse grained, uh, the, uh, the, the real concentration field you measure from the experiment. Um, which are the result of the additions of the elementary sheets. These, uh, these concentration, uh, uh, concentration distribution evolve towards uniformity as time or distance progress in the medium um, and, are, and are parameterized by uh, precisely a parameter which increases as expected exponentially with time or distance reflecting the number of overlaps we have described before. So we'll come back on this precise mathematical form, but we just need to understand at this time that we have an index here uh, which is reminiscent or a measure of the number of overlaps in the medium as a function of time, as a function of the time spent by the mixture uh, in the medium. All right. That was for the overall field, right? We will now split, as I have announced, the mixture in two and wonder how the subparts of the mixture, the green and the red, interact and intermingle uh, in the uh, final overall mixture. 
So, no confusion. We were doing this before. I was just describing the overall concentration field, all green, if you like, without, uh, so I was describing the shades of gray, if you like, without um, making any distinction between the initial localization of the particles in my initial blob. This is what we are doing now. From this, we have derived the shape of the concentration distribution of the overall field, but now we like to split the field in two, like that, do the same kind of thing, describe the trajectory of the red or blue, if you like, and the red and of the overall blob if we confuse the, the, two, uh, the two colors, for instance. So the total field now, the field which we have described before as C, is in fact made of the addition of two subfields, the red and the green or blue. All right. So, in the absence of diffusion, molecular diffusion, there is no mixing. In fact, you can see it here. In the absence of molecular diffusion, so the diffusion coefficient set to zero, the time it takes for the concentration differences, if you like, in the medium to decay is infinite. So, in, in absence of Brownian noise, if you like, you just have stirring, stirring kinematics, the uh, stirring or blending motions you're imposing in the system, just put the particles at different locations in your, in your medium, but the local concentration is not altered at all. Mixing is all about the interplay between substrate deformation induced by stirring and diffusion. So in the absence of diffusion, there is no mixing. There is no Carger school, which would be sad. You're adding uh, apples and oranges there. What? You're, uh, when you say that the concentration is the sum of the red and the blue, mm. you're adding two different things. What is the meaning of that? You are all, uh, first, you are always able to say that one thing is the result of the addition of two subparts. For instance, you are the addition of your shirt plus your tag. Okay, that's, that's, you, you're always able to do that. Now, your question, I imagine, refers to the dynamics. How do the subfields you have arbitrarily chosen to define interact with each other? And do they cooperate to the formation of an ensemble that, you are, that has a physical reality? That's your question, yes. I imagine. That's a good question. And the answer is yes. You will see. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes, precisely for the reason which is written at the top of this slide. The Fourier equation is a linear equation, meaning that any concentration field Uh, yeah, I mean, you need to follow too, you know, it's not because you're sitting here. <laughs> Any concentration field can be represented as a sum of elementary sources located at different locations with different amplitudes. This is what is written here, okay? So, I have chosen to represent my initial condition like this and like that. That was the, I don't know, blue and that was the red field. I am following the red subpart, the green subpart, but I know that because locally the dynamics is described 
by Fourier equation, Fourier equation on a moving substrate, but still a linear equation, I had the right to divide the initial condition in two and to make the final superposition of the two. That's a very important point. Thank you for raising it. We have seen in real time, <laughs> sorry. We have seen in real time the, um, the microscopic process of the lamella interaction in, the, in Tongi's lecture, I think, from the um, Blown experiment. It is, uh, it, is, it is in action here. This is at the microscopic scale what is going on in between the two subfields in our problem. Inside one field, inside the green, inside the blue, but also in between the red and the blue. This is, you can follow exactly the concentration fields. They are brought together by the uh, stretching motion in the, in the, uh, in the flow. The, uh, the distance between the two lamella decreases faster than uh, the, the typical width of the lamella, the reason why, and this is the reason why there is a, there is a superposition mechanism. So this can all be uh, studied very, very carefully and very uh, precisely in any stirring field. And the result is that if you are following the concentration distribution of one subfield, the red for instance, of the green as well, since they have in the experiment I was showing before, this just random stirring of the blob, essentially experience the same stretching history, they give rise individually to the same concentration distribution. We will derive its form afterwards. But there is a magic operation which allows to go from each sub-concentration field to the field of the super ensemble composed of the two elementary fields. The one you would see if you would not be able to make the distinction between the red and the blue, for instance, or if we had uh, decided to uh, color this initial blob uniformly in white, for instance. All right. This magic operation is the one which transforms the two elementary distributions into the distribution of the super ensemble. And this operation, in the present case, is a convolution operation, which is consistent with the microscopic reality that the two fields, the red and the blue, are intermingled at random with no correlation. So in other words, the fields are not like that. They, are, they would be correlated if, it, if they were like this. They are rather like that. If I, if, if I stay at a given position, the fact that the concentration of the red is high does not imply that the concentration of the green or blue is low nor high. I mean, the two fields are uh, um, sampled at random and intermingled at random with no correlation. And in that case, the concentration of the super ensemble is just the convolution of the concentration distribution coming from die one and the concentration distribution coming from die two. Does that, doesn't that imply that you've got to have a certain minimum time? Initially, they're separated. Yeah. So initially, it's anti correlated, and that, they are, that there is no correlation whatsoever. A Absolutely. Time, say, Absolutely. A diffusive time scale or something like that. Well, it's more than a diffusive time scale yeah. because including in the presence of diffusion, and by the way, that was my answer before, you require, diffusion is required for the concentration levels to be distributed at any instant of time because initially you start with uniform concentration, one in an ocean of diluting uh, medium. So the fact that the concentration are uh, distributed is a proof that uh, diffusion has occurred, but they, they could well have these two blobs experience exactly the same stretching history while uh, remaining close to each other so that at a given instant of time they are transporting exactly the same concentration. And actually you can do experiments, I'm not showing this here, but you can do experiments which display pretty much that other 
completely correlated limit. It is possible to devise Turing protocols where particles stay from both sources, stay so close to each other that they basically experience exactly the same history in the medium. That's not the case here. And of course, the fact that they are superimposed, I mean, the, the fact that they are intermingled uh, assumes and Im implies that diffusion has, uh, has uh, time, has had time to, uh, to we're, we're, we're by far at instant of time larger than this one. Okay? All right, so let's, let's proceed. I'm, I'm about to conclude. All right, we've seen this before. Just to mention qualitatively, because uh, we're um, uh, always um, thinking the same in pulse media and in turbulent media. So this um, procedure of uh, lamella compression, uh, coalescence, and the definition of uh, uh, this coarsening scale that we have heard about before uh, does exist in a turbulent context as well. This is where it, would, it was conceived, by the way. I am, as a matter of conclusion, just a, a, a very simple slide, you know. So we're, there, there is a mixing ratio, right? Mixing ratio is extremely interesting. We have been working on that. Let's work on this. So what's the probability of having a concentration C1 given that we have C1 plus C2 from the two sources? There is a standard exercise here for students of the school, that's the uh, probability density function of having C and Z. If the two distributions are gamma distributed, and we will come to it, um, then in that case, there is a wonderful result, which tells you that the distribution of concentration of the final mixture, the one coming from one and two, is a gamma distribution as well, so it has the same mathematical form than the mathematical form of the original sources, and that, this, that the distribution of the mixing ratio factors out so that there, there is a product of two distributions completely independent, that in that case, the mixing ratio should be described by a beta distribution. That's my conclusion slide, or close to. Um, I'm, I'm approaching, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, this is too complicated, but this is a graph which uh, essentially tells you that all what we have predicted o actually occurs in the post medium. We have the two sources, the green and the red. We have the composed field, ignoring the difference between the red and the green, which is indeed the convolution of P1 and P2 here. And we have also the fact that the mixing ratio is described with the parameters coming from the original distributions, the mixing ratio which is described by this beta distribution. In other words, understanding how one and two are uh, intermingled with each other allows you to make a prediction on the composition of the overall field and also tells you how the two fields are in relative proportion in the intermediate state. That's the strong conclusion. Solid walls, what do you mean? The, 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 the grain walls. The grain walls. Yeah. Well, the grain walls are precisely there to impose an adherence condition allowing for the existence of this stretching rate. You know, U over D exactly means that. It means that the velocity gradient between grains is established on a length scale which is given by the distance between two grains, D over, uh, with, with, a, with an intensity, with the velocity which is typically given by the mean. So U over D means that. So that's the, the adherence condition. Yes. So at some point, okay, you, you have the winding by diffusion of your line. Yeah, sure. So what is the diffusive strip method? Is anybody, does anybody know what the diffusive strip method is? Maybe we should explain this before. Yeah, 
So the diffuse strip method amounts at advecting uh, a line into the field to compute the stretching intensity along this line at a given instant of time and through the transformation I was making here between the amount of stretching and the local concentration to infer the concentration content of the mixture. The kinematics infers the concentration content of a solitary strip. And the objection here is a good objection. Uh, this person is saying, yes, but since there is an adherence condition at the, at the solid walls of the beads, uh, the uh, line will be stuck there and will not progress in the medium anymore. And the answer is yes, but for the line to be stuck at the wall, it has to penetrate the wall. It has to reach the wall. And since precisely the, 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 the velocity is zero there, the probability is that if it was not close to the wall, it, it touches the wall, that probability is essentially zero because the time it takes for this event to be realized is infinite. But that's a good point. Yeah, but there's another one. All right. Along the direction of transverse to your strip, if you're bounded by the walls, for example, both sides during a constriction, yes. I'm not sure I understand the, 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 the question. So you, you are, you are speak louder. Yes. On the of your line. Yeah. But uh, this is okay if the last of boundaries are. Oh, yeah. No, sure, sure. But again, again, these are, again, these are, these are very singular points, uh, which are, I mean, this is also something we can, we can guess from the, 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 the zero solder kinematics. This line has a length growing exponentially fast in time. So all these pathological points you're mentioning here, there are others, you know, there are also regions where there are very high re radius of curvature where, where these kind of ideas break down. Okay, uh, all, all these pathological points will become progressively minoritary in front of the regular regions of the flow where the planar, free from boundaries uh, description is valid. And this you can show in particular by doing the uh, diffusive strip method.